Thanks so much for checking out the Board Game Barrage podcast. The audio quality improves drastically starting with episode number eight. So feel free to skip ahead, but these episodes are pretty good too. Beautiful. One take. That's one take. They say the truth is the number one stopper. They say you think, but you never want to speak up. They say you're hiding now. Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of the Board Game Barrage podcast. Uh, with you as always, we are your hosts. I am Neelan and with me is Kellen. Hello. And Mark. Hello. Uh, we are the tanks on the Board Game Barrage website. I am the orange tank, Kellen is your red tank, and Mark is your green tank. And if you notice, they're actually just recolorings of the same image file. Just like a palette shift? Yeah, so it's literally... Ruining the mystery, Kellen. the same person. <laughs> they were all explicitly designed with That's those right. colors in mind. Yeah. Yes. Very exact specifications. For, exactly. For orange, the worst color. <laughs> Best color. To match. So, uh, as always, we're going to be talking about games that we've been playing in the last week or thinking about, just anything that's been on our mind. After that, we're going to go into our feature topic this week, which is something I think of a contentious topic around what is appropriate with kingmaking, jostling for positions, and like what the general philosophy of how you approach a game even is. Being a sore loser. Right. Or like, yeah, if you feel like you're on the outs, like how do you even play from that point on? Right. So yeah, look forward to that. First, let's go into the stuff we've been playing, uh, starting with Mark. Yeah, so I've been playing Wide Earp from 2001, which is a Rio Grand game uh, designed by Mike Fitzgerald, who just released a couple years ago Baseball Highlights. I know he's done a bunch of card games in the past, and also uh, co-designed by Richard Bork, who did Stonehenge. Uh, he's done a lot of war games this is an unofficial member of the Mystery Rummy series of games. It's supposed to be the best one. I've been dying to... I've had it in my collection for a while. I've been dying to play it. I've heard it's one of the best three-player games out there. Couldn't find it in your apartment. That's right, exactly. It's just... I've got stacks and stacks of games. Sometimes they get lost. But uh, this one was found. And uh, finally, after all these years, got the chance to, to play it. So it's a, it's a Rummy game. If you're not familiar with Rummy games... In this game in particular, there are seven outlaws, and each outlaw is sort of a suit of card in the game. And uh, what you're trying to do is amass the most points. You're trying to capture capture these outlaws by playing them from your hand into melds on the table, like sort of like sets, in other words. And so you play. So you say there's Billy the Kid. You play a set of Billy the Kid cards from your hand to the table, and you keep doing that until somebody runs out of cards, and then the person who has the most Billy the Kid capture points, which basically has played the most Billy the Kid cards, gets the most reward, like of the reward from Billy the Kid. And you have to get a certain amount of points for the even capture an outlaw. This game is unique because it has powers. There are cards that instead of just being a suit matching one of the outlaws, they're like a power, so you can like mess up other players. And there's an interesting mechanic where if you play one of these power cards, you flip a card from the deck, and it, if it shows a bullet hole, which is on about 50% of the card... Your action is successful, so there's, so there's a bit of like luck in there. But I loved it. It's a really I find myself, even though I can I'm sort of down to play any type of game, I really like card games with simple rules that offer a lot of tactile and strategic choices. And I think this falls in that category. It's not as good as the greatest game of all time, and in this genre, Biblios. And it's not as good as the second greatest game of all time, Arboretum. But it's in that wow. sort of vein. Wait, so there's no board. There's no board. It's, it's just card games. How cards. big is this box? I'm trying to picture. It's a it. super small box. Okay. It's like maybe a, a fourth of a like a ticket to ride box. And how long does the game take? About uh, 45 minutes, yeah. 60 minutes. But it uh, and I've heard it's one of the great three player games. And I played it. My my one time was a three player uh, run of it. And uh, yeah, I just thought it was fantastic. A lot of I love card games where every time it's your turn, it's a tough decision. You always feel like. Like it's a brutal, brutal call, and uh, and this is uh, no exception. So yeah, if you're into card games, if you're into games, you know, in the vein of Biblios and Arboretum and Zany Penguins, those kind of card games or Rummy games, especially for yeah, I mean, certainly scratches the itch, I think, for people who are into classic card games. So this is maybe a great gateway game, actually. Mm-hmm. Come to think of it, people, you know, your mom or dad may be fans of Rummy or you know, Jim they Rummy. know the big card yeah. games. So yeah. Rummy go, Cube. Come on. Right, yeah, exactly. Like yeah, yeah, that's the one most. Right, people. so it's it's all and yeah, Rummy Cube is very similar to this. So yeah, I would I would very 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 highly recommend it. 
you know, I'm always in for a, a really new game, but I love finding diamonds in the rough, like old games that you sort of have been forgotten. And I think White Earp sort of falls in that vein, and I think it's, uh, yeah, just a fantastic, really easy to explain, really easy to play, but with tons of interesting, tough decisions and enough, like, luck in there. Uh, just a dash of it, but enough in there to, to sort of spice it up. I'm not super familiar with, like, a lot of these games, but you... I haven't played Arboretum, but it, I, I've i heard it's an especially it's mean... Uh, I yeah. I would like to play it. Yeah. Uh, is that just, like, part of the genre, or is it... No, no. well, Arboretum and Biblios aren't rummy games. They are part of this, like, sub-species of games in my mind, where mm. it's, like, games that are just... You know, Bar- Biblios has dice, but they're basically point counters. But games where they're almost exclusively cards... And you know, it's just a, oh. just a deck card. So, okay, yeah. got it. So it's more just like the the play style of game, then, right? Like, and like the design, be. like the got basically it. like the form of the game, just okay. being a deck of cards, basically. What would you say is the difference between regular set collection and what defines like a rummy variant? So, rummy games are a, a big subsection. There's a ton of different kinds, but what you're trying to do in a rummy game in general, sort of the thing that ties them all together, is that you're trying to play melds, which are sets of cards similar suited cards to the table and you're also trying to go through your hand the first person to discard his last card ends the um, round you're not necessarily getting the most points if you end the round but you if you play it well you know generally the person who plays the last card has set himself up in a good position you know if you're the person who ends the round you're probably doing it with scoring the most points in mind and um you basically, when you're playing these sets, the more cards you play of a certain suit, the more money that's added to that outlaw. But once somebody has opened a suit, anybody can join in. You don't have to play any number. You can play any number of cards. So there's a give and take. You know, if somebody has started the red suit and they put a lot of money on it, you may want to, on your turn, play that card or you may want to sort of sabotage that. But basically the biggest thing is playing sets of cards and figuring out if you want to join in on that suit with your opponent to try to get some of the money, some of the points off of it, or whether you want to go for your own suit or whether you want to sort of try to sabotage, spend your energy and your time hurting them. So those are the three main pathways. Am I going in with an opponent and trying to get some points? Am I going on my own? And you know, then you're sort of worried about what they're doing because you're not checking them as much. Or are you going to spend your resources checking them? Those are, I mean, that's a very, very general way of explaining how the, how these Rummy games sort of work. I think I'm just excited by how thematic the whole experience feels. But yeah, right. yeah it's, it's, I feel like I'm in the Old West just, right. like, just <laughs> hearing about There are it. bullet holes on the cards, so that's thematic. Billy the Kid, Wide Earp, you got all these guys. Uh-huh. Do any of like, the powers like evoke that at all? Are you, you're, you mentioned that you're using them, like you're essentially capturing these outlaws. Right. Like, does... uh, on, I mean, honestly, not really. Yeah. This is not a game that you would play for the theme, which is also sort of a theme in these in like Biblios and Arboretum. They're not games that necessarily drip theme, but just the simplicity of the rules and the strategy and the tactics. Like, There's always a tough decision. That's, that's basically the calling card of these types of games. Is the card art good? It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I, I mean, for you something guys, here. You got, I know. I know. <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, you can put a cowboy hat on. Okay, okay. fair enough. You know, That's I'll it. Let you do that. But yeah, it's yeah, it's not it's not the most thematic game in the world, but it's fantastically designed. Okay. I, I would super recommend it, especially for three players. That's cool. That's why it up. I have been playing Coffee Roaster. So we spoke about this very briefly last Again, week. Again, Neil. Yeah, I'm still playing Coffee. I'm still By playing yourself? solo games on my own. Uh, it's all I've played <laughs> last week. No, that's not true. But Coffee Roaster is a, just to recap, is a solo game that is, I, you said exclusively Japanese? I mean, uh, yes. I, I think it's coming to the U.S. But uh, yeah, okay. for right now, yeah. Okay. It may be available actually on, at the Board Game Geek store. Ah, be, yeah. interesting. Okay. And it, it is a bag-building, push-your-luck game. So... The idea is that you are a you know a barista, a coffee roaster, and you're sort of you have these beans that you're sort of trying to roast the ideal cup of coffee from. The way this works is you have a whole host of different cards that represent different bean types, okay, and each of those represent different starting conditions for your bag. So you'll always have a few zero tiles, and these are just like little discs that would go in your bag, and those represent sort of like unroasted beans. And over the course of five, six, maybe seven rounds of play, you're pulling beans out of the bag, increasing the number on them as they roast more and more, 
putting them back into the bag and repeating. You have a bunch of other discs that give you powers, which I'll come back to in a second. But the idea is like over multiple rounds, you're sort of gradually increasing the, the value of the discs that go into the bag. So that at some point, seven rounds down the line, you say, okay, I'm done. I think I'm happy with, with the way that my bag is currently built. And then you'll start pulling back them out one by one until you have 10 to make your coffee cup. The aim is that you're trying to hit a certain number or as close as possible to a certain number at the end, as well as get certain sort of flavor discs that are required for this specific beans flavor profile. Okay. So you're, you're trying to build the bag towards the right conditions so you're, conf- you're confident enough at the end of that, you know, those seven rounds of play that you'll be able to get everything you need to hit the conditions you need. It sounds like there's a luck element the, the bag is sort of constructed in such a way where right. you're probably going to hit what you need. Right? Yeah. The the way that sort of mitigates a lot of the luck is that there are there are, there are a few things. So, A, you're sort of like, you don't have to like be memorizing anything that's in your bag. So, you're tracking, every time you increase sort of like the roast level of your bean disc, you're tracking how much it is. And you, okay. it's very easy to work out how many things you have left in your bag. So, you sort of, sort of know like roughly the average roast value right. of your bag. So right. that sort of thing. Obviously, the actual discs you pull at the end, are, there's still a luck component, but then there are special powers that throughout the game you're sort of unlocking. I see. So this is kind of one of the key aims, like secondary to the roasting that you're trying to do, is that there are the five end-of-game special powers. There might be something like, okay, for two of your pulls, pull two discs and pick one. Right. Right? Or at the end of your, your ten discs, take two away and recycle them for another two right. and choose from those. Or give you more like more leniency to say, okay, I'm not happy with this pull. I'm just going to put this aside and pull something else out. This sounds a lot like I don't know if you've played them to Court the King or Favor of the Pharaoh. I haven't. No. Okay, so these are games where you're um, you're, you're rolling dice, and the number of dice you roll, you can get like a str- like Yahtzee. That you're basically rolling Yahtzee. Okay. Dice. And at the beginning of the game, like if you get to a certain point total, which is a low number, you can like unlock powers, and you're basically which which maybe sometimes will like let you flip a dice or mm-hmm. give you more dice and you keep building keep building so at the end of the game maybe you're rolling when you started with rolling four dice by the end of the game and this is like a, a multiplayer game you're rolling maybe like seven dice and at the end you've ha- you've sort of like earned all these powers for the dice and then the game ends on a roll off okay so everything you've collected up to the point is like in aid of like mitigating that final sort of right or whatever. yeah that, that, that definitely sounds sort of similar because like throughout the game one of the balances is I could be building towards one of these powers or I could be better constructing my bag right effectively so it's, it's that sort of trade off that leads to some of the interesting decisions because one of the things that sort of heightens this game is that there are these rounds that are like these double roast rounds and if any of these beans gets too high in value then they're effectively ruined okay so you sort of want to prep yourself so that by the time you get to a double roast you know you'll be able to handle it with some of the, the other discs you're Got pulling it. uh yeah it's, it's actually it's really neat like i i've played i haven't played like a huge number of solo games but this one i've i keep coming back to because it's it's pretty quick uh it's about 10 minutes to do like one small round of it and like a full game is like three rounds where your previous result like affects the difficulty of the next round okay. so what, one of the things i've enjoyed like having tracked my score for it is i can see myself improving at it which is always kind of a cool feel like i feel like i'm just getting better at better with this game which felt initially like it was mostly luck but yeah. it's exposing like how clever the oh, decisions cool. in it yeah, are yeah it definitely are. feels different than those two games i mentioned it, there seems to be more more to it let me ask you this, Neilan. Are you more or less lonely after playing Coffee Roaster? Well, Neilan is a robot, as we've pretty yep. so he doesn't feel. He doesn't, I, I don't feel. Lonely. Yeah, he doesn't feel lonely. Yeah. So. I just like I like the thrill of roasting coffee like privately in my own time by yourself. Yep, selecting the perfect bean. Exactly. Yeah. Being a coffee Speaking snob. Speaking of, of bean, um, so how thematic is this? Thing? <laughs> like, do you smell? I mean, is there a? I only ever play it when I've made a fresh pot of coffee. <laughs> and yeah, totally. I'm actually trying to do both at the same time, like make an actual cup of coffee there while I'm playing. Yeah, absolutely. Dexterity game element. Totally. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that's coffee roaster. That sounds cool. Uh, Kellen, what you got for us? So I think it's pretty easy to say that I have the best game of the week we're talking about because one of you talked about a solo game and the other, the other one what? talked about a horrible rummy variant. Look at uh, this guy. No respect for the classics. That has no theme. Actually, I'll have you beat 1995, dude. I looked this up. Okay. El Grande. Oh wow, that's even came out than in we 1995. So some of us were children, uh, and some of us were a little old, and we won't say who here was old and <laughs> who was a child. Um, but El Grande is sort of the king of the area control genre. Area control, area majority is something that nerds like to debate on the internet, but 
we're just going to call it area control for the sake of what we're discussing here. But an area control game is a game where there is a board or a set of cards that are divided up and they score uh, differently depending on how many, how much control you have over that area. So in El Grande, the, um, the map of Spain is divided up into territories, and then at three times throughout the game, you score those territories. So what that means is you have little influence. In the old versions of the game, those were cubes. They've been upgraded to meeples in the most recent version of the game. So one-third of the way through, uh, if you have the most... Uh, meeples in Granada, for example, you'll get five points, the second most will get three points, and the third most will get one point. It's sort of like that, but depending on the area, they'll have a different breakdown. Some areas will be 5-3-1, some will be 6-4-0, and and then there are ways in which to impact uh, how an area scores. What makes these games so exciting is uh, the amount of interactivity that is found within them. Um, You're constantly like moving each other's meeples or adding more meeples into your section to try to have the most control. Um, There's sort of like 20 battles going on at once, and you can never win them all. So there's this constant feeling of, I'm losing over there, but is which battle is worth winning because I cannot fight all of these fronts? Right. Yeah, you described it as almost like a game of finding the least places to lose at more than the opposite. We just had a great game um, of El Grande that we played, and I think... One of, the, one of the coolest elements that we can just talk about is uh, the Castilla, probably butchering that, but that's <laughs> castle. And so throughout the rounds, um, so it's three rounds and then a scoring round, you can uh, throw meeples into the castle instead of putting them out on the board. And then at the end of, right before you score, everyone will choose an area secretly and all of the meeples that they put into that castle will then be applied to that area. Sort of flood a region, yeah. You can never quite know. You're trying to remember how many how many meeples has Mark put in the, the Castilla and then where is he going to put them out on the board and it's sort of this constant pressure you're sort of just afraid. You know you're always susceptible to a, to a big flood when the, when the Castilla gets revealed. Yeah, and it leads to, like all this amazing like double think of like where well, I think they're gonna go here, so I have to like counter that, or will they? Be? Yeah, it's, it's great. So we've kind of described the basics of it, but how does a game like play? Like, what are you doing on your turn? So you have a hand of cards that are numbered one through thirteen, and so that is there is an auction that takes place every round where everyone will bid a card, and you can only use each card once. 13 means you want to choose your action first, and you want to go first. On the board. So there'll be uh, five cards out on the board that represent different actions, and those are sort of randomized in a couple different decks. You know, for example, one will say, you know, move two uh, meeples on the board and move one of your opponent's meeple. So if you want to do that action and you, you desperately need to do it, you choose the 13 card. Once you've bid 13, no one else can bid that amount, so you will always win if you bid the highest number. But remember, if you use that in the second round of the game, in the eighth round of the game, you don't have that 13 card that you need. Right. So you're constantly evaluating throughout the entire game, how much do I need to do the action that I want to do at the bottom of the board? That leads to, I think for a lot of people, a little little analysis paralysis as they're trying to figure out. But it's a small little component of the game that feels so great. And I think... What's so interesting is that this game came out in 1995, and I'm not sure there's a better area control game. That It's so smooth, it's it just smooth. plays, yeah. and, and, and there's nothing that feels finicky or sort of tacked on. Um, right. It all sort of works together with itself. So in uh, this particular game of El Grande we played, um, I'll cut right to the chase, and it's a recurring theme, is that the three people here in a four-player game <laughs> did not win, and we are once again bested by Christina, right. uh, who beat us uh, in a stunning beat, finish. Beat me, I think. Well, I, I was beat me by by a point. Yes, yeah. um, but we had Mark, who was barely there with us. Yeah, at the I was. End. I had I had run a, a 5K in the morning, and then all of a sudden we finished that second round of scoring, and we went to the seventh game round. And then I just I just got super nauseous. I just felt green and started getting clammy, and I just put my head down. Yeah. <laughs> I had my head you down around the game, head down on the table for like the last third of it. Yeah, and the rest of us were arguing. Yeah, <laughs> just, just put your meeples out. For Christ's sake, I'm dying here. Yeah, no, it was um, a great game. I yeah. think Christina and Mark got out to an early lead, and then Neilan and I struggled to recover. And so it got to the eighth or ninth round, and and this is what sort of ties into our feature topic of the day. Neilan and I clearly, I think at the last two rounds, could not win or were very close to could not win. 
Um, and I was in third place and Neelan was in fourth place. And we were debating what to do uh, and who to sort of attack. Mm-hmm. You, know, you don't attack anyone sort of outright in this game, but if you go into an area that someone else has control over, that's essentially right. an attack. Yeah. At some point, you have to pick a region that is being controlled by a specific player. Right. And so uh, Neelan took the coward's way out, uh, and um, he decided to, <laughs> to try to attack. It. That's how his programming is set he up. He tried yeah. to attack me to get ahead instead of attacking Christina, who he could have done more damage to. So so, so what actually happened, if I recall? <laughs> well, so, okay, because at that point, like, Christi- it was pretty clear that Christina was well ahead, right? So the, the this discussion became, is it worth going after the winner? If I know I'm not going to be able to be here. Whereas I knew I stood a chance, perhaps, of overtaking you for, you know, not to be in last place. And is that more, you know, is that a more worthwhile goal than going after the leader in that case? So basically what we're talking about is this idea of kingmaking, right? Which is when you're, to clarify, is when you're a player who doesn't have a chance of winning necessarily, but you effectively get to decide who the winner of the game will be. And then th- that becomes like a very, you know, a very big topic, which is, I say, fiercely debated online a lot, which is what is fair when it comes to kingmaking? Is that ever appropriate to sort of be a passive player deciding, deciding the winner if you don't actually have a chance to win? Which actually, this is our feature topic for the, w- for the week, and it sounds like we're kind of right in it. In so should we, yeah, should we just go straight into it? Yeah, so yeah, in the broadest sort of high level, uh, let's say, Mark, what do you feel about king making in general? I think for me, what it comes down to is the player's intent, the player's genuine intent. If they are playing to win, or even playing to, you know, there's times where you know you're out of game and you decide maybe to try a, a, an interesting strategy. I think that's fair, even if that strategy is maybe harming the structure of the game to a, a degree. And there's certainly a, a line that can be crossed where you're ruining the experience for everyone or for most players. But I think if your intent is not to harm the game, I think most stuff is fair. I think the the times where I would have a problem with king-making are the times when a player is doing it with the intent of messing up the game for somebody or although there are games where I think that's even even that is fair. Mm -hmm. Um, The games where there are much more cutthroat negotiation. I think even a little bit of that is fair. But as long as you're trying to make the game more fun or you're you're not trying to harm the, the quality of the game, I think most things are fair in general. Yeah, it sounds like if it's if you're approaching it from a position of spite, that's obviously... Uh, well, actually, I guess within the context of a single yeah, game, think, maybe yeah. not that big a deal, but certainly you probably shouldn't be carrying over anything I think the previous the, games. The one thought for me that if it goes in a player's mind is crosses the line is... I want I want to ruin this game. I, I'm not having oh, yeah. fun. I just want to ruin this this game. Right. If you want to ruin like ruining some like if you say to yourself I want to ruin somebody's experience, that's close, and that depends on the game, uh, and it depends on your group for sure. But I think that as long as you're not trying to ruin the quality of the experience in general, I think most stuff is fine. Yeah, I, I think I'm mostly on the same page in that. I think if you're as long as everyone is coming into the game. I think with the intent that, hey, this should be a fun experience for everyone. Like, that's the aim of playing a game, ostensibly, right? Is to create a mutually fun experience. Right. Right? So if your specific intent is, hey, I'm just going to ruin this because I'm not having a good time. That's kind of where I... So here's the hypothetical, right? Right. We're all playing Risk together. Classic Risk, Mm -hmm. everybody's favorite childhood game. Sure. And Mark, you know, you cut me off from Australia early in the game. I'm in a distant, even third place, let's say we're playing a three-player game, a very distant third place. Right. Uh, and um, so, so far, it sounds very accurate. Yes. Rather than bowing out gracefully, I kamikaze with my forces, puncture you through North America, going on a rampage that I literally know I will lose, right. but that allows Neelan on the subsequent turn to go right through that hole and just decimate you. And so that has a an element of revenge. Right. Because you cut me off from what I told you. Like, all I want to do is control Australia. Right. Is that cool? It depends on the... No, no, no. Is that cool? Yes or no? That is cool. Neelan? I think so, yes. That's okay. Yeah, within the bounds of one game, though. Well, why does it have... Well, that's an interesting topic. 
like the meta game part of it. Yeah, like what do you? It, it depends. I think that depends on your group. I think I think there are groups where that would that enjoy that like long term. You know, you got me in this game, so I'm going to try to get you back in this next yeah, game. Yeah, I, I just I don't know. That's where I kind of joined the line a little bit. I don't know. I think it would depend on the people I'm playing with. I think if Kellen and I were playing a couple of games or something, I think we could. I I would. I'd be okay with him like getting me for the last game. I mean, I think it just depends on the the personality of the people you're playing with and the game you're playing. There's some games where playing like a spiteful strategy is much less in line with the spirit of the game. But a game like Risk, especially I think when gamers are playing at Risk or a game like that, is the negotiation. Mm-hmm. Is the like, hey, leave Australia to me or else. Right. Like if if that if some sentence along that line has been uttered in a game of Risk. Then yeah, then everything is cool. Yeah, then if, if somebody's gonna say don't Nothing march into Australia, or I'm gonna get you. Then we know what kind of game we're playing. Uh, right to some extent, like to be clear, like if you know, say I've played a game of Risk with Kellen and he's betrayed me in a way that severely hurt my game. It would be naive of me in the subsequent game to like wholly reset my stance towards Kellen, right? right. To be like, oh yeah, he's just we're totally on the clear. Like I'm not it's suggesting interesting that. How meta you're getting right now? Because <laughs> but, but, you but, already but, don't trust me in any game we play. Right. Which that's that's just like my default your stance. King making. Uh, no, but but which like you are adamantly against. <laughs> I, I again, like I think approaching the game with the stance of. I probably am not going to trust Kellen as much as another player. I think that's totally valid because that that, that what well, that because that's literally what you just but that said. is specifically because of the experience I've had playing what? these games. Is with this you. a that's character attack? Pretty much. I, think I feel like it's a sign of respect. <laughs> yeah, I would love somebody say that about me. <laughs> a sign of respect. Dear God. So let's jump into another specific example because I feel like this helps illustrate things really well. Which side you're on, so to speak. So we are playing a game of Rising Sun that I won. Spoiler alert, <laughs> so everyone's on the same page, uh, despite Neelan's... I feel like many people are tuning off the podcast after yeah, hearing that. Yeah, after hearing that. Um, so going into the last turn of the game, or the last war phase of the game, and Mark was going to be unable to move any of his forces, uh, which meant that he was in no battles. Right. And Mark and I were sort of jostling for first and second place, and it was pretty clear that one of us was going to win. Or, or, or yeah. We were most we likely. Yeah, yeah, most yeah, likely to fair. win. Yeah. Uh, Christina, uh, who usually wins, uh, was in a distant fourth place, or, right. or near the, the back of the pack. And Mark realized that he could not do anything with the coins that he had, which are only used as sort of like battle fodder. Right. And so literally, uh, without negotiating anything, without saying anything, right before the trade phase is over, he just gave all of his coins to Christina. Right. um, Without a negotiation, without a trade. And then Christina went on to wreak havoc in the battle phase. Battle after she won every battle, I think, or she may have. It was close. Kneeling. I mean, definitely like a couple of good, really good fights that were like you know key territories for us. I lost every battle in that okay. phase. Still won the game, right. so that that is part of the discussion. Yeah. But after the game, I was sort of just struck by, while while technically in the spirit of the rules, which is like you can trade. This is a trading game. You sort of threw a huge hail mary. That had such a, a big impact on the game, and you didn't know whether it was going to work or not. And it right. sort of felt like it reminded me of that moment, you know, when you're playing a Monopoly or, or or a Bonanza with a couple, and one of the couples just gives all their money to their partner. Who, uh, you know, if two people are working together, right, the game is broken. Sure, and one player will always win. Right, and so I felt sort of unjustly attacked in a king making sense. Uh, and this led to a huge debate um, where no one agrees with me just to, to be... Right. You guys can jump in with how you how you felt about that action. Yeah, I mean, I felt like it was the only move I had in the game. So I was in no battle. So basically, as Kellen mentioned, I had these coins that are only used in battle. And I wasn't going to be in any battle. So I had no reason... I had nothing to do with these coins. So in my mind, I'm trying to do anything I can at this point, even though I'm not going to be actively involved in the war stage. I'm trying to do anything I can to rein Kellen in because I think he's my biggest rival in terms of winning the game. And the only thing I could do, literally the only action I could do, is give my coins to the person who, A, I thought was in probably last place, 
And B, Christina's playing, I think it's the Fox clan. Right. Yeah. So her clan's asymmetric power is that she can pop up in any battle where she doesn't previously have a figure. So she could be in she could literally be in every battle. Right. I think so she's easily had, the most disruptive. Absolutely. Power in without that a game. doubt. Without a doubt. So I'm thinking I'm not gonna be in any battles. Christina can be in every battle. Christina is probably not a threat to first place to me. And Kalen is clearly my biggest threat to first. So what can I do in the position I'm in to try to win the game? And the only thing I thought I could come up with, and I still think it was the right move, was to give all my coins to Christina. And look, Kellen didn't win a battle. Did something. Yeah, it, yeah. It, my, my plan worked in that respect. So I started complaining, like I always do, uh, <laughs> before the game ended because I wanted to make sure that it was clear that my argument had nothing to sure. do with winning or losing. But let's say Christina had won that game. Right. What, what would be your takeaway from that game of Rising Sun? Because my takeaway would be if one player gives all of their coins to another player, of course they're going to win. Without any trade, without any obligation to help or hurt you, you just right. gave them all your resources, that player will win the game, and the game is broken. So your question to me is, if what would I have thought if Christina had won the game? Correct. Okay, well, so if she had won the game, and I think the points at the end bear this out, because it was you in first, and I was... Not so far behind you, I don't think. And Christina was one point behind me, and then Neilan was, was farther back. So I presume in that case, Christina would have won a close game. So it wasn't like I was giving her resources and she was going to run away with it. And to be, and this is really important. Like, If I felt like my coins, giving my coins to Christina would guarantee her the victory, there is no chance I would have done it. I wanted to win that game. I was not trying to like oh, I'm not going to win, so I'm not going to have my biggest rival win. That was not at all. I wanted to win the game. If I if I was sitting on 40 coins and I thought, okay, giving 40 coins to Christina is going to make her win, I would never have made that move. I thought it was enough to disrupt you, but not enough to give her the win. That was my. That was exactly my, my, my plan. So did the entire game rest on that decision? Did the enti- yeah, in the end it did. The outcome was de- how much, what percentage of the outcome of the game rested on you giving all of your resources in a third of the game to one player. Probably quite a bit, but the thing is that is that is looking at that moment without context because the context where you negotiated and threatened No, that's to true. This. And look, and, and I I've I've said and I, I I do believe that if I could roll that moment back, I would have negotiated with you at the end. So in the game we had the martial mandates which allow you to move your your characters on the board, your your pieces on the board was not played, and Neelan and Kellen were in an alliance, and they had the last two actions, so they were the only ones, when it came to it, that could have allowed for movement and therefore allowed me to get in a battle. And in retrospect, I certainly should have tried to negotiate with Kellen or Neelan to play the martial action, and I, I would have. I mean, in retrospect, I would have. At the time, I just did not think there was any chance. I thought you would have considered your position in such great power that you wouldn't have. Done right. that? that? Maybe that's not true. I also, and this is like sort of a weird meta game thing, but I also thought that if I did that, it would be like a sign of weakness, like negotiating with you. Because I was, yeah. I felt like, and that's sort of like a step towards the meta, not like not just the meta game of that game, but it's meta games between you and I in general. Like I'm showing Kellen weakness in this game, it might hurt me in other games. <laughs> I mean, it's silly. It's 100% silly, but like that's part of the, my thinking. And it's sort of, I don't know, it's silly, but it's sort of fun. To have these like mind games with your friends like long term. Mm-hmm. So let me let me change my tactic here because you sound entirely unrepentant. I'm a, <laughs> to be clear, I am I am entirely so, unrepentant. So let's think of our our, our poor friend Neelan. Sure. Who's um, uh, pushing along in third place? And actually, this is another component of king making we can talk about, which is he was in third place, yep. likely to stay in third place. Had you not used such a brash and uh, brilliant cheap <laughs> tactic, your obligation in a game is to always try to win. And I would argue that that extends to if you're in fourth place, you should be trying to get into third place or second place or first place. Okay. So your move took Neelan, by no fault of his own or no action of his own, right. from third place to fourth place. Right. So you king maked him, like like whether or not reverse you, kick, like I sort of like you you knocked him, him down a position. Yeah. That he otherwise would have had yeah. rightfully with no action, no sure. anything that he could have done. And yeah. so why is that not 
well, a form I, of kingmaking. It's sort of telling in this case that I didn't feel that strongly about losing that. Well, you don't because, feel anything. <laughs> yeah. Robot, yeah, yeah, but I, 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 yeah, my programming hadn't sort of like positioned <laughs> me to like feel that strongly about it because I, I genuinely felt like Mark didn't have a move except that. Like I think Mark's prerogative to like come in first overrides any concern he should have over my not coming in last. You know what I mean? I have a slight argument with your responsibility is always to finish the highest place because I think if you're out of it, sometimes you can try to do weird strategies to, to have a funner time. But in general, I agree with you that you're trying to, you should try to get the highest position as possible. And that's exactly what I was doing. I was trying to get first place. I didn't care about Neilan's place. I didn't care about anybody else's place. I, I would argue that by getting to the point you got, you had been beaten and you used a cheap tactic to try to get back into the game. I think that that's is crazy. crazy. I mean, there are, there are people online because who you, can't, you, you didn't trade anything. Wait, but You gave away wait, all your resources. Sure, but you're saying your argument is that I was beaten and therefore... you Like by getting to that position, right. you, yeah, it was over. Yeah, but, but you, you said yourself like the, the reason that you made your stance about the situation clear before the results were in was because if you lost, you wanted to make sure your, your argument had been submitted before. So the, the, it, you, was, it was not that I had lost. It was that the action felt so ridiculous. Are you telling me that you thought there was no chance you were going to lose that game? Oh, no, no, no. I just wanted, I, I wanted it in case I lost. I thought I was right. going to lose. Okay. I thought I was going to lose to Christina. Okay. Because she won like seven battles in the last... Well, there were only, what, six. And, but... and yet, you say that, but yet, I still finished in second place. By one point. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. But I finished in second place. Sure. Yeah, we're never... I, we've sure. Talked, no, so, I, yeah. I love... Yeah, I mean, I we've think talked for 20 minutes arguments. here. We've talked for hours... Yeah, sure, yeah. You know, there were some hurt feelings. <laughs> yeah, not that was on great. My, not on my part. Not on my, obviously, well, yeah. I was sort of that was on Neilan's part after we on did oh, the, yeah. the feeling program. Right, right. But but so let's let's dive in because I don't agree with you, but I also have bad examples. Here's a small little example. I can say it in 30 seconds. We're playing Agricola uh, with some of our other strategy minded friends right. who know all the cards. So I will never win. And about halfway through, I know I have lost. You know, I haven't been feeding my people. So I was completely uninterested in the game. Right. So I switched my strategy. Instead of focusing on scoring points, I decided to become the boar baron. That meant that I was going to hog every boar on the board, no matter what, even right. if it wasn't my best move, and prevent anyone from getting a boar. Now, this was amazing because I made everyone call me the boar baron. and right. Sort of, I literally, all my house was a boar, you know, all of my fields had boars, I had way too many boars. It was ridiculous and awesome. You were boring. I, <laughs> oh, my man. Um, but but what that did is actually one player had gotten a boar prior to me becoming ascending to boar baron status. So he had uh, the golden boar. He, <laughs> and all the other players um, got screwed, literally, because I was hogging, you know, they were grabbing, you know, there were these resource spaces with tons of wood, tons yeah. of reed. And you were And instead, the... I, I was taking all the boar, you right. know, so there was nothing that they could do. And they were unjustly penalized in, in, in what amounts to like a, a Euro optimization type mm -hmm. game. Um, now, I had a lot of fun playing that game. Right. But I'm not sure that everyone else did. So what is my obligation as a player? Because I feel like I started the game. I said I would try to win. Yeah. And now that I'm behaving erratically, I'm king making in a sense. It's not the same that I'm choosing. You know, I want Mark to win, but I, I was choosing to hurt the game. So I'm interested speak. in your read on that game at the time. Did you feel like other people were actively not enjoying what you were doing? Well, they always feel that way when they're playing with me. New ones, but <laughs> but, but uh, a little bit. I think there was a little bit of annoyance. But I was, I was. There's no way I'm going to get through another hour of Agricola if I am not the boar baron. Right. right. I, I honestly, I feel like it comes down to your intent. If your well, intent, so what was my intent? Your intent was to try a different strategy. Your, your intent well, was like, well, not try a different strategy. Try like a novel approach or a weird. Try to have fun. Yeah. Try, we'll try fun. something that would right. make the game. If your intent was like. I'm out of it. I'm just going to ruin this game because if I can't have fun, nobody can have fun. That's beyond the pale. But so what I feel like is the game breaks. I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Like we're closer than we are apart, you know, both sure. literally and um, I don't even know what I'm saying. Not, not, not close enough literally, yes. in my opinion. But what I'm saying is, is sometimes games feel like they only work when you shake hands and say, I'm trying to win at all times. Right. Now, but what I do agree with you is to say that it's more about the experience. You know, we're playing Cosmic Encounter. We're playing even any game. It's more about the fun and the stories that you tell with your friends right. than it is about the game. But with that said, I think the games can break down 
if people aren't playing to win. You know, like sure. a, a lot of times, like Puerto Rico is a, a classic example where they say like you are unjustly affected by a, by a good or yeah. bad player who is sitting next to you. And so to me, some of these games don't work. And Agricola is a, is a good example because if someone is behaving just completely erratically, you could be unjustly penalized. In this case, the boar players lost points. The players who did not have boars lost points because I was being an idiot. Right. So well, how do, but how do you reconcile? Like I think I think there's it, multiple ways of reconciling it because it's a um, heavy strategy game, right? So here's here's how you reconcile it. You were good enough at the game where you can adapt a strategy that doesn't require boars in Agricola. You just you have to. You are in a situation where boars are now off the table. So now you've got to do something. If you're if you're the best Agricola player at the table, and this is the situation that's been presented to you, figure it out. There's a wild boar baron. Yeah. So it's, figure I mean, it out. You, you don't think like enough of the early game strategy like hinges on that to the extent that someone could just be completely screwed over choices they made early on maybe but but my point is like to me the biggest thing is the intent of the player who's causing this chaos if the intent of the player is causing the chaos is i'm not having fun in this way i'm going to try something crazy because it'll make me have fun totally fine Mm -hmm. you know maybe some games i would be less okay but i I, honestly it's hard for me to, to think of something off the top of my head but if the intent of the player is I'm losing the game, so I'm going to wreck it in a very specific way because if I can't win or have fun, then nobody should be able to, that is, again, out of bounds. I think there's something sort of cool in the idea that somebody's playing a strange strategy or like a edge strategy for whatever reason, as long as, again, the intent is there, is not there to, to harm the game, and forcing the other players to play a very weird strategy to counter it. That's sort of cool. Like... I'm sure, like, Agricola plays, you know, different every time, but, like, how many times have you have the, the players that played at that game played in a, in a situation where boars were off the table? Like, it forces you to think of something on your feet that maybe you never would have. It, it makes the game, like, different. It makes the game a very unique game of Agricola. And, again, and here's another refutation on your argument. You said, and I agree, that, like, one of the best parts of games is the winning, obviously, but also the, the stories that you have with your friends, right? Or, like, the moments in the game that make it really cool. Okay, I've played three games of Rising Sun now. The greatest moment was that moment. Oh, right? my gosh. Because, not because, not, no, no, not because of the strategy involved in my move, but in because, because, because of this. Yeah, because there was, of the there discussion w- around it. Well, one second. To be clear, there was a ton of great strategy in that move. But, but because of the, all the debate we've had, the best part of any, and I like Rising Sun a lot, but the best hour or half hour of Rising Sun that I've had in the, in the three games I've played was the half hour after that last game finished where we were debating. That was great. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was a very fast... And then also, Agricola, I bet that the players who... Maybe not. I could be wrong about this. But like the players who played Agricola with you in that game, I bet they remember that game. Right. How I, many other memorable games of, of Agricola? Agricola I mean, I'm sure had. they remember the first time sure. they played, but whatever. But that, but that game... That one stands Yeah, out. exactly. So you're making a memorable moment. You know, you shouldn't play weird or play strange strategies just to like hey I'm gonna make this memorable so I'm gonna like you know hoard whatever but like I think it's totally fair so what this makes me think about and what's sort of confusing to me is we're saying that if if a player from the very beginning is just behaving completely erratically that they might have a they're, they're having a negative impact on the game they're king making they're not trying to win if they're just completely behaving like chaos the right. entire game from the get-go you're saying that's yeah that's their their intent is to sort of ruin the game but but well or you're saying their intent matters but what i'm saying is what happens when you have a player who's just playing really badly like they're literally just bad at the game okay and how does that translate in this discussion because there are games where if, if one player is playing incredibly badly that right. screws one other specific right. player. like Puerto Rico, yeah. Yeah, and so even in the context of your Rising Sun move, like, it's let's say it's completely legal, which yeah. it's not, but let's say it well, is. Well, which it is legal. Well, let's, sort of, because you didn't trade anything. It's perfectly legal. It's not a trade. What did you trade? Are you, okay. I don't, Any, okay, anyway, well, okay, is, we're, we're never going to agree. Okay, well, we can look at the rule book and see that I'm right, right. about that, but go on, go on. Well, <laughs> you can... There's many ways to interpret a text, okay. Okay. Mark. But so let's say that your move was completely your yeah, move is completely sure. legal. Okay. But your move is incredibly suboptimal. Let's say Christina won by seventy points. Yeah. Right. Like you just made the yeah. dumbest move of all time. Right. Like that is also this like weird form of king making where yeah. Mark, you're an idiot right. and you just 
are yeah. dumb. And, 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 and you know, really I just driving that point home. I want to keep saying <laughs> Mark's an idiot. He, he did lose, so, you know. Some... But, but surely you can't hold, like, ineptitude, for lack of a better word, against a person when it comes to that. Those but I think there are people who do do that. That's what I'm... Like, yeah. Like, there are people who play online or who, who, or, or when they're talking about their strategy, yeah. they'll say, like, you have to do this move. Like, that's your best move. And if you don't, you're messing with the balance of the game. Right. I've heard about people, like, fighting over where they're sitting in Puerto Rico if they see, like, a new player coming in. And that's... Games are sort of judged by how much they accommodate or don't accommodate kingmaking. You know, and that's an, another part of this discussion we haven't talked about where some are way better at mitigating king making than others right um you know where you have sort of at one end of the spectrum like glorified spreadsheets that like neilan likes to play where we're all doing our spreadsheet isn't this fun and then on the other side of the spectrum games that are highly interactive where you can just get in each other's business those allow for a lot more king making situations and so my net net is that rising (laughs) sun should not have allowed you to make that move i am floored that this is your opinion because like oh, Mark. I am I'm 100% floored because honestly when I made the move one of the first things that popped in my mind was this is a Kellen move You'll never that, that was actually the respect. thing that, that, that surprised me the most it, it struck I think both of us yeah. as like this is something that Kellen would be super proud of like this is me and like this is my life so to be clear justifiably so because <laughs> right. it was a brilliant move <laughs> but um but this is like my only move. Like you yeah. thought you'd screwed me over, but here I come in with my right. last power Don't move. You, like, I mean, I think in a Euro game, you sort of maybe want a little more of that reigning in and like that game on rails so that the king making doesn't happen. But I think in a negotiation game, the best mm-hmm. ones are the ones that allow you to freeform right. and let you just like take the rails off and let you just go. And if you're going to have a, a terrible player that ruin it, then it's the player ruining an otherwise good game. It's not a game that's necessarily flawed. If you're playing with people that that you enjoy playing with and that are also, you know, people that you are on your level or whatever, the less rules, the better, I think. Or the less rules that have to, like, rein in behavior, the better. You don't want a negotiation game that says, like, you this must... Is you, yeah, yeah you that this m- only be trade for this. No, and I think that that gets... I mean, basically, I'm, like, I'm for freedom, basically. <laughs> Free, and I'm and you're the, somehow not. The communist, yeah. yeah. No, and I think that that gets to what the game presents itself to be and sort of the mechanics of the game. You know, you have a game like Agricola, we can say, where if someone could give away all their resources in Agricola, it right. would just be completely unfair, right. probably. Sure, yeah. Where So where Rising Sun is billed as this sort of negotiation, but, Euro hybrid. So like, like what the game is affects this conversation. Absolutely. Would you have the same issue in a game like Diplomacy, for example, which is a game that is entirely built around those sorts of social structures? Yeah, not at all. Because See, but, so, but the Rising Sun is very much was always built as kind of I, that was a the, complete No, I, I I agree with you. But like well, I do think that they're trying to like I, I think these moments are a core part of what makes that But certainly so, the intent of the designer. In this it. specific game, no one had traded anything for the entire game. Right. And then the only trade, and I'm saying trade and there's air quotes happening, okay. the only trade was you giving over 10 resources to another player for free right. with no any, there was no trade. So here's the thing. I, well, the way I remember this happening is like like we alluded to earlier, like we had intentionally shut Mark out. We locked right? them out using the Euro you, you, game Yeah, mechanics. using the mechanics of the thing. I, but at no point does it enter our minds like, hey, uh, Mark, do we want to like convince me otherwise that this is in our best interest right because right? no one has paid anyone anything the entire game but that's part for of it's three hours that's still a that's still definitely a part of the game that's like is it, it w- definitely is that that's i think the only trade that's happened in all of the games okay played. well i've definitely we definitely had trades in games that i've played it hasn't been like the diplomacy any more than city. two coins yeah, I mean, there have been promises. There have been promises that have been fulfilled, like hey, I, and I think we definitely had those kind of trades. That's yeah, a different kind of trade. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, where we no, said no, like no, no, I'll no. stay out of this and you stay yeah, out right. of this, and I think that happens every game of Rising Sun, basically. But I mean, it's a core part of the game. Even though, it, even if it doesn't happen, it's not like any, nobody thinks that something like that couldn't happen. I mean, mm-hmm. you when you play Rising Sun, you know that that is te- definitely a part of the game. Just because it hasn't happened, and to be to be clear, I think that I should have, or, you know, there should have been more negotiation about that, but I did not, I didn't think for an instant that it was like a bad move, or I, like, bad, it certainly wasn't bad faith, and I don't think you think it was in bad faith. But if anything, no. I kind of feel like the onus was less for not realizing that Mark was fully capable of giving his coins away. I think the net net is that I'm somehow a sore winner. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> in this instance. I don't know if that's it. It just fascinates me that I think I, I just see you as like the negotiation game guy, the guy who will like play the negotiation games like in the purest, most cutthroat, which is my opinion, best form. Like that's exactly what I like. And it just uh, surprised me that you thought that you would have seen a cutthroat. And I think I've conceded that not on, you know, maybe not on the podcast, right. here, but I've conceded that. I think, technically speaking, the rules allow for what happened. Right. But what it felt like, given yeah. the game state, given the the rules, yeah. given how we had played for, you know, five the hours majority, in yeah. two games, it yeah. did not feel like something that should exist at that moment because yeah. it was such a huge swing of power for what felt like nothing. Like, nothing could yeah. be done. And to be, to be clear, like, I totally get the emotional side of your argument. Like, if I had been in your spot... I can definitely see it as like a feeling like you're put in a position like outside of anything out of your control, but you just need to get good. I do not understand well, the I'm emotional not. sides of anyone's no. arguments. I won the game. That's so true. Just, I'll keep saying that, and Mark can edit out like four of them. Yeah. I did win this game of Rising Sun. Yeah. So I think, I feel like we've run the course on that discussion a little bit. We're probably I mean, not going to more meat on that agree. Bone, yeah. 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 There was one winner and, and a couple of losers. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, I don't think we're going to agree. Uh, so why don't we move into stuff that we're uh, looking forward to to close out the week? Yeah, I think we're uh, we're kind of all ruminating on an El Grande uh, rematch. Yeah. Where, rematch. Where I'm not yeah. on death's door. We're not dying yeah, halfway exactly. through. There's always an excuse, Mark. But uh, <laughs> you were literally... <laughs> his head was... That down. was the it power was so, move yeah. this game, was Mark profaning his death. Yeah. yeah. So. But I think we've both... Uh, we've all made a little secret pact here that yeah. we're going to... Um, we can't let Christina we win. We can't let Christina right. win. She's yeah. asleep in the other room. But uh, if there's so, one thing we agree on, it's to go. Everyone go off to Christina. Yeah, she next game. cannot win the next game of El Grande. That's right. That's right. And that's how you king make, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and that that is king making <laughs> one hundred and one. That's right. <laughs> Okay, so that's going to close out our show for the week. If you have liked the show, please follow us on all of our social media. So that's on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter at brd game barrage. And yeah, is that it? Is there anything else on this Yeah, end? if you have any uh, feedback, go ahead and email us at boardgamebarrage at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're always looking for ideas right. and suggestions. Yeah, we're always looking for like comments on the podcast post as well. If there's anything that you'd want to like say about stuff we've discussed or would like to see us talk about, then yeah, all that's always welcome. Or are you, who your favorite tank is. <laughs> yes. Sort of out of the three of us. That's, Green. Yeah, awesome. that's going to be great. It's red. Uh, so yeah that's going to be it for the show thank you so much for listening Uh, thank you as always to um, Heart Society for letting us use their song What's In Your Mind Kid for our intro and outro you can visit them at their website which is heartsocietymusic.com and yep that's it bye see ya so long In the case of El Grande, there are these areas set up in Spain. Uh, I think in Spain. Spain. <laughs> I hope uh, we cut that out. I <laughs> love the geography and the world. And the um, Spanish. You love the Spanish. Uh-huh. And I love the Spanish people. Yeah. My girlfriend is Mexican, which is at least <laughs> that's, tangentially that's, yeah. related. It's basically Spain. They speak Spanish together. Um, 